Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Traders Workshop. I'll be your host, Tom Schneider. I'm really happy to have back on one of our initial guests, uh, Brent Kochuba from Spot Gamma. And we're going to be talking about what this week entails going into uh, op options expiration at the end of the week. But before we do all that, before we bring Brent on, I do want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. I just want to remind everybody that futures and options trading contain substantial risk, not for every investor. Uh, you could potentially lose all or even more than all your initial investment. That's why we recommend using risk capital. What is risk capital? It's money that you can afford to lose, essentially. It doesn't keep you up at night, doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I do want to remind also that past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results and that the information presented in this program is not intended to be nor should be taken as trade recommendations or financial advice, but rather should be used for educational purposes only. And with that out of the way, let's welcome Brent Kuchuba. Brent, how are you doing today? I'm doing really great. Thank you for having me back on. It's uh, going to be fun to talk to you again. Great. Yeah, we had such positive response and uh, to your first first uh, appearance on Traders Workshop. Traders Workshop, where we like to bring in people uh, from the Ninja Trader ecosystem to talk about their specialty and see how does this fit into your trading uh, uh, trading profile? And and hopefully you can take something out of this uh, this next forty five minutes session and employ. Um, I do want to recommend that if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please drop them in the chat. Also, while you're there, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. Um, but with that, uh, Brent, just to give a little refresher, um, where are you located and um, you know, what are you doing with Spot Gamma, if you can explain? Yes, th thanks. So I'm in the New York City area. I'm actually based out of Connecticut. And what Spot Gamma does is we analyze the <laughs> options market to try to predict how that will impact the underlying equities and futures market. Uh, so uh, that's primarily focused in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, uh, but we also look at individual stocks as well. Uh, and what we do is we write a daily analysis and then we produce a bunch of key trading levels. So where's support and resistance from an options perspective? And then also how much volatility can we expect? And so those are the, uh, that's kind of the core of what we do here uh, at Spot Gamma. And, and your background a little bit, if we could touch on that as well. How, how did you get to where you are with Spot Gamma? You're the founder of Spot Gamma. So um, what was your experience before Spot Gamma that led you to, to start the company? Yeah, so I have uh, coming up on 20 years of experience, uh, a lot of that on the sell side, the first about 15 years on the sell side, I was with Credit Suisse and Bank of America, and I was on the uh, equities and derivatives desk there as a broker, I then went to Wolverine, which is a big Chicago uh, operation, as you know, and I was a broker there for a while as well, and then uh, after that, I went to the buy side. I worked for a family office where all we did was focus on the S&P 500 options complex. And so I studied that day in and day out for about five years. Uh, and into the pandemic, unfortunately, that fund was closed. Uh, but I had all these options models that I built, right? And, uh, and all this experience focusing on the S&P 500. And I saw how uh, the options market could really shift around what was happening uh, in the S&P 500. And so from that experience, I thought, hey, there's a lot of different ways to apply these models, these options models, right? And, and so uh, in January of 2020, sort of as the pandemic kicked off, uh, I put the models up on, on our site, spotgamma.com, and, and kind of the rest is history. I've been writing daily notes ever since then. And uh, those models that you, you had been developing while you were with the family office, did you find them very helpful, especially helpful in the pandemic as the market uh, you know, just kind of cratered, right? We saw that uh, COVID effect and then the the remarkable resurgence. Did you find them especially helpful during that, that where others might not have seen those levels? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. And, and, and I think this is kind of an interesting point about options analysis, just kind of writ large, whether you get it from spot gamma or there's a few other people that, that talk about the effects of, of options. And, and, what you would see is a framework for uh, explaining a lot of things that happen in the market, right, that, that are otherwise kind of unexplainable, right? Um, if you're a macro guy, for example, you tend to sort of, you know, look at CPI data or, uh, you know, different flows through that lens. If you're a technical analysis, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, moving averages and here's the 200 day and here's a Fibonacci or tracement or whatever it may be. Um, and what we really do is positional analysis, right? How do the positions, how are options positioned in the market? 
Um, and how might the hedging flows tied to those positions um, explain a lot of the market movement or allow us to forecast what's going to happen? And so when you had the height of the pandemic, uh, volatility was exploding, right? The VIX hit, you know, 80, right? It was one of the biggest VIX spikes ever. And lo and behold, we had this giant options expiration in March of 2020. And when that expiration took place, right after that expiration, the third Friday of March, uh, the market just started to rip. And all these giant put positions uh, were at that same time removed from the marketplace. And so you could see this dynamic of the market rising just because of the way positions were shifting, right? And not at, not at a random moment. This was when all these positions were expiring. So when options expire, you know, hedging flows are forced to react to that, right? It's it's not this sort of situation is, is someone going to hedge their put now or not? Well, if the put's going to expire and it goes away, someone's got to react to that, right? Someone's got to make a move after that uh, because of the fact that that these contracts are expiring. So it, it really sort of shed a light on, on how this analysis can be incorporated really into whatever your strategy is. If you're a macro guy, this information is still helpful. If you're a futures trader, you know, a lot of what I was doing initially was trying to prove to people, particularly in the future space, that um, that these options levels were important to watch, right? Because I, I don't think intuitively you might sit down and think, well, why do I care what's happening in the S&P options market if I just swing trade futures? Um, and it's because the options complex in the S&P is so big that you need to know how those flows are shifting because that impacts the movement of the underlying. So, Brent, what I'm hearing is during the pandemic, those shifts were so um, stark or so sharp that it really helped you. It kind of promoted what you were doing, right? So it's easy to see and it's easy for people to follow along. And those shifts still happen, just not as dramatic uh, in in normal trading. Well, let's call it normal trading relative to COVID. I don't think we're in normal trading right now. Uh, but, you know, relatively speaking, it's not as dramatic, but certainly still there. And it's something to pay attention. So it's almost like maybe COVID helped helped you out with, with you know, promoting your models or, or at least giving uh, a lot of credence to your models. Yeah, you know, that's another great question. I, I think the, uh, so, so the sort of first phase of, of, long after spot gamma in 2020 which is not you know admittedly all that long ago everything that we would talk about is trying to prove to people uh or try to get people on board with the idea that the options market could impact the way that the underlying was trading you know that that was a lot of what we were focused on here's how this link could work here's how options flows could impact equities explaining why that mattered and and the big change for us was the meme mania in in january of 2021 because suddenly everyone became familiar with the idea of a gamma squeeze, right? All these call options were trading, stocks were going crazy left and right. And suddenly it's like everyone jumped on board with the idea that the options market can drive, uh, you know, the underlying equities. And as we shift into the pandemic, this has actually been a really interesting period because it's almost like in a way the bandwagon has shifted too far, right? Now everyone tries to explain every single move with options flow. And it's like, well, hold on, you know, nothing controls the market all of the time, right? The, the, the point is to find out where and when the options flow is going to matter the most, right? And, and, and that's where we have some edge. Uh, for example, around large options expirations. We just had one in June. There's another one coming up here on Friday. Those are uh, times when the options market may be more impactful. But, uh, you know, if the CPI prints at 10, the options flow doesn't really matter there, right? Uh, because, uh, macro flows are going to be kicking in and, and all sorts of other stuff is going to be happening. So the, the pandemic has been very interesting from that perspective because macro really has has come back to life. Attention to macro flows, the way that people are trading around macro flows. I mean, it's a sea change in terms of interest rates and all the like. So there's these, you know, elephants in the room, i.e. bond flows that are shifting around and and the equities that are tied to them. And, and now it's about being a little more surgically precise about saying, okay, this is now in the context of all this macro flow that we've had this year, this is a pocket or a window where the options market's gonna take control, right? Here's where you can identify that. And it, and it offers actually, interestingly, a lot of edge, right? There's, there's not, it's not as consistently day to day, you know, the, the, the most important flow as it was, I think, arguably in 2021. But when it does matter, right, when it shows up, you want to be ready for it uh, because it can really impact the market quite a bit. So, you know, 
talking about the other ways uh, people look at the market, right? Um, you mentioned technical analysis, and I'm proponent of technical analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, you do have people looking at fundamentals or reports. Of course, we have a big report coming out tomorrow. Yeah, uh, we have a you know another report coming out Thursday, and then we're rolling into to options ex expiration. Um, I would argue that your analysis is right up there with technical analysis. You know, it's taking data from another market, right, from the options market, but it's still analyzing the behavior of data. It's just not necessarily time series data. It's it's uh, you know levels and and uh, anyway you know my point is you know how do you incorporate looking at tomorrow looking at Thursday with these big reports how would you incorporate with what you're doing is it important to know what these levels are and could they move around uh, the the report tomorrow yeah so when we look at the options market today. Uh, there are a couple of key trading levels and then there are volatility estimates and the volatility estimates come from how big the hedging flows are in the market and, and right now they're decent size hedging flows um, and, and it's mostly put options that are trading that's kind of the bulk of what's being hedged right now and so I bring that up because whichever way the market's going to move off of the CPI reading tomorrow I'm sure there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction uh, the options flows are set to sort of exacerbate that trend right so if the if if I, my my base under case is that if cpi comes in low particularly very low you know that's probably going to be a little bit of a bullish bounce for the market if i had to guess right because people think okay that maybe the fed's going to back off a little bit now right so the knee-jerk reaction is going to be higher and if you look at the way the market's positioned right now there's kind of pretty light resistance there's some resistance but it's light resistance up until four thousand at four thousand there's a ton of big options positions there and we think that creates a wall there right uh, we call it a call wall in our daily notes but as the market sort of rips higher you're going to hit this level where there's all these options positioned and that creates a sort of pinning effect right a lot of hedging flow should kick in there and kind of zap momentum <clears throat> now to the downside it's a little bit interesting right because if there's a hotter than normal cpi reading certainly something like we had uh you know in june that's going to kick off macro flows right they're going to start selling because people are concerned about rates going higher and the options market's just going to start adding on top of that right and the reason is because dealers who are on net likely short puts right and if you're short a put the way that you hedge yourself is you sell futures so as the market goes down dealers are going to start selling more and more futures the other side of that coin is that implied vol is going to spike right the vix is going to spike up higher if the market really starts to drop and if the vix is spiking higher that's telling you that writ large put options right in general all sequel put options are getting more expensive put options are getting more expensive imagine your short puts that's not good for you right you got to hedge more so that means you're selling more futures so basically what that means is a worse than normal cpi print the options market's going to expand that volatility to the downside and really push the market lower and we see 3700 is kind of the initial stop right there's there's a decent amount of open interest there uh in the short term uh so you know tomorrow we could get obviously you get a it's a range of outcomes based on whatever that number is options market you know is is gonna is a is just gonna influence right whatever the trend or whatever the whatever the main flow is coming out of that data point so with these targets we've got four thousand on the upside if if the market you see a call wall there you see resistance there we would say yeah. and then of course you see maybe a little bit of a floor at 3700 based on the fact that if the market prints a bit a worse uh, cpi number than expected that pressure is going to just exacerbate because of of volatility increasing etc um that's just for tomorrow right so we're going Correct. into to options expiration do those levels change I guess today, looking at on Tuesday, do you have different levels set for each day normally, right? So, yep. so there's there's big levels that have large positions that expire farther out in time, uh, typically usually quarterly expirations and the like. So 4,000 has been an important level for the whole year uh, in our models. And even though we have this expiration on, on Friday, it's a monthly expiration. It's not all that large. It's not, certainly it's not as large as June, but it's important enough to sort of what we're looking at is release the current trading level so we've been kind of pinned around the 3850 to 3900 level with this options expiration we think kind of the pin for there gets pulled 
Um, but 4,000 is, is a level that's going to you know, be significant in through the end of the month. The other thing to kind of note here is, you know, you asked me, I sort of said, well, the market could go up or the market could go down, and that's true. And what this sort of sets up in our view is once the market sort of shows which way it's going to move after the CPI reading, we have these levels that you can use as targets, right? Okay, if we're going to start breaking out, well, 4,000 is where I maybe want to hold my long until we hit that level, or I want to play mean reversion off of the 4,000 level. And similar to the downside, right? Um, the options market is going to help influence the low. So if the market starts to break lower tomorrow, we would suggest that you want to ride that ride a short position into that key 3700 area but back to sort of your original point some of these levels are going to change you know intraday 4000 and 3700 are likely to be there through uh, cer thir certainly through the end of the month um, but the other thing that's likely to change is volatility right because right now volatility i.e. the vix is at something of a low the vix is right around you know 26 if i'm looking at my screen right now and that's that's about a one month low in and around the one month low and put options in general if you look at skew and some other metrics are telling us that there's not a lot of demand for downside options protection right now there's not people looking for a one standard deviation kind of limit down day we haven't gotten one this whole year that's been a big story and so really in the last two three weeks puts have been heavily sold and that dynamic we think is going to change because one you have the the uh, options expiration friday which means a lot of people who are short puts, uh, those puts are going to expire. But then on uh, next week, on Wednesday, there's a VIX options expiration, which is a pretty sizable VIX options expiration. And if you look at where the VIX call positions and put positions are lined up, there's almost like a straddle. So there's a bunch of positions at 25 down to 20, and there's a bunch of positions at 30 up to 35 in the VIX complex. So we think that those positions, which are relatively clear between 25 and 30 in the VIX, is kind of keeping that VIX kind of in a, in a little bit of ping pong range, right? You could say the VIX is somewhat range bound. Uh, you know, options purists will scream if you use technical analysis on the VIX, but there is this range between 25 and 30 where we think is fair value kind of for the VIX and it's, it's fairly fluid in there. So we have that dynamic, uh, which again is sort of an unpinning of this VIX range for Wednesday. And this plays into the FOMC on, on the 27th. People don't wanna be short options short puts or selling volatility into the fomc right because you don't know what the outcome is going to be he could say one wrong word and suddenly you know all heck breaks loose and so this trend of selling puts and selling volatility which really boosts the market up is that's starting to change with this friday's expiration because of the fact that we have friday's opex vix expiration fomc um, obviously the CPI reading tomorrow, but then there's also a slate of earnings coming up, right? And I think people are going to learn a lot about the economy through that. So there's a lot of catalysts for volatility to kind of pick up or for people to start to want to own put protection. And in general, that, that creates a headwind for the market, we think, instead of a tailwind. And would you see that shift? So we've got, like you mentioned, we've got a lot of things, the start of earnings season being one of them option expiration, VIX expiration, FOMC, a lot going on in the summer, right? In summer, we yeah. think, oh my gosh, we're going to take a break. It's nice. We're going to take a vacation. We're going to go by the pool. I know uh, Jim and I talk about having a pool meeting, poolside meeting every, <laughs> you know, every day, right? And it's, but really there's a lot happening here. And do you see as uh, we get closer, let's say to um, uh, you know, earnings earnings week uh, kicks our earnings season kick, kicks off next week. Um, will you see a shift? Do you think towards the the uh, higher end of that VIX uh, straddle, or what did you say? You thought it was a, like, kind of like a straddle, like straddle like a position, straddle, yes. right? Yeah. Do you think you might see uh, a flow into the upper area of that straddle? Let's say would indicate negative news going forward uh or negative times for the market going forward yeah and, and you know with the cpi reading tomorrow i mean if the cpi reading comes in under expectations you're going to get that initial rally up into to 4, 000, right and i think that's a rally you'll be able to fade with a high degree of confidence because of the fact that people are going to want to start to hedge after uh the the you know, the VIX expiration and then going into FOMC. So I think that's a route that you can really fade because vol is going to probably pick up as we go into the FOMC. And if volatility in general, if when I say vol, you can just picture the VIX in your mind. The VIX is up. That's a pressure for the market to go down. Higher VIX means options are more expensive, which generally means that that, that is a market headwind and vice versa. VIX down generally means the market's going to trade higher. The S&P will trade higher. 
So, you know, if we get this sort of initial rally tomorrow off the CPI reading, then I think that's something that you can fade uh, into the end of the month. And conversely, if, if we get this initial sort of, you know, real sharp drop tomorrow, right, because uh, of the CPI reading, we'll get a, a snap down to 3,700. Then you're going to end up with the situation that a bunch of puts are going to expire on Friday. And that could provide a little bit of relief in the short term, I think. So there's some what you call kind of path dependency to this, right, based on the reading. I, now, on average, the CPI will probably come in around expectations, right? Let's just say that statistically speaking, that's probably going to happen. You know, I'm, I'm not even sure what the, what, the, what, what the market is looking for here. But let's just say the reading comes in in line. Uh, which is the safest bet, right? And if that happens, then I think that the market will still probably drift off because of the fact that that just puts it back in the Fed's court in terms of we don't know what interest rates are going to do. And I don't want to just be short puts uh, or short volatility into this Fed meeting where you don't know how we're going to react, right? You don't know what's going to react. So again, it's this idea that over the last two weeks, there was no catalyst really in the market, right? We had the 4th of July holiday. It was a shortened holiday week. There was not much going on. And so that allows traders to want to sell puts and sell volatility, and that helps to boost the market. Now the impetus or the, or, or the, the lineup of events, like you said, the catalyst in this course sort of summer months here, the catalysts are lined up over the next two weeks, um, and that opens a window for higher volatility. I would also just mention, I mean, if you think historically, the sleeper sort of sell-offs, the nasty ones come in the summertime, you know, when a lot of people are at the pool and they're not paying attention. Um, the, the market kind of in a way feels sort of like, you know, 2018 a little bit to me in that you just could never get a rally in that 2018 window. And, and, and I think it was in August that things really fell apart there. You know, August 2015, you can go through these times where things get a little bit nasty in the summertime. So um, liquidity in general, I think is just very poor. Whether you look at, you know, the CME has this great tool called the liquidity tool. You can look at E-mini uh, depth of book and it's very low, right? It's very thin. I think the same thing is in options. So you know, these the moves and the swings can get exacerbated, obviously, because of the fact that that liquidity is pretty poor. Um, and so, you know, I think it means that you get a little, bit, a little bit lighter on your feet. I also think it means that some of these phenomenons, right, like expiration, like have outsized impact because of the fact that liquidity is poor. You get a little more juice out of what used to be more benign events. Well, and, and I think that's why it's so important to understand what levels are you know are important to you or or to what we do which is to say that when there is m movement that's unexpected 4000 is nice to know that there's a call wall there 3700 looks to be that there's support there based on the options market we use pivots we use different tools so right if you know anything can happen on any day and even without these reports without these events without earnings you know the market can move and and you know, you don't want to be caught unawares of what levels are important. Yeah. And and it's, you know, everything is a feedback loop, particularly when we're talking about, you know, when I'm talking specifically about the options market, I should say. Um, you end up with these feedback loops where if the market is going lower and vol is going higher, that means that dealers have to sell more futures in theory and, and demand for put options increases, which creates more downside pressure, right? And so, you know, these are feedback loops that, aren't data dependent necessarily. If the market's going lower for whatever the reason may be, you know, the options markets just kind of kind of expand that, right, with, given the positions that we're in. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a great point. And oftentimes you see, you know, there's a clear options catalyst uh, or I can explain flows in a, in a, in a, in a pretty uh, succinct way, right? And, and you look at kind of, you know, the news on CNBC or something and they'll blame it on earnings or whatever it may be, right? A move on, on the prospect of someone's earnings being bad. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these flows are sort of ignored, even though they are so significant to the market. Um, and I also say, you know, when you look forward, there are these big options positions that a lot of people talk about. The biggest one, probably this JP Morgan collar trade, right? Um, that rolls every single quarter, you know, it, it sells an out of the money call and it, and it buys a put spread. Um, and those levels now are watched by a lot of people. And, and this almost, in a way, to me, kind of plays along with technical analysis in a way, right? Everyone knows where these positions are, are right? Uh, currently, right now, I can, uh, I shouldn't have the strikes. I just drew a blank on the strikes. Um, but I think it's at 3,500 is this long put, right? And, and when everyone knows that level is there, it almost becomes, in a way, like technical analysis, right? Everyone knows where the 200-day moving average is, and that's what makes it an important level, right? 
Uh, nothing actually happens at the two-day moving average. It's not like flows kick in, but if everyone's watching that level, it's like the, the market will magically draw to that line and, and find support in there. Um, and that's kind of one of the interesting dynamics I think of the options market and, and when I look forward at low, you have, I think it's around 3,400 is the February high pre-pandemic. We now have this big JP Morgan trade that's structured right around that level as well. Um, so that becomes a very interesting level where I think technical analysis probably shows something. And I'd be curious your, your thoughts on that Feb high, the Feb 2020 high. But then there's also this options positioning that, that kicks in. Um, what, what do you think about that February kind of level? Is that something that you look at at all? I don't mean to put you on the spot there, but I don't know if you've thought about that at all. Well, actually, we we go back to, you know, it's interesting. We use, as a reference, Jim and I use um, a, a reference of kind of the the lows right after that high right after right before the 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 dip you know we have that um we have that low in march of 2020 so right it was making market was making new highs in february there and and before the pandemic there's there's you know it's certainly something to be said that there's an interest around there um but you know i i think again it's it's your point about seeing what everybody else is looking at not necessarily triggering an event for yourself off of it, but just understanding that if everybody else is looking at that level, like you said, 200 day moving average or the, you know, the JP Morgan uh, options positions, whether it's the, you know, the put, the, 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 you know, puts they have on, you know, that's important to know because something might happen there. Even if, even if it's, and nobody does anything, if JP right. Morgan does something, then, you know, that might move the market. Yeah, yeah, and that so the put spread is uh, for September. It's at thirty five eighty is where they're long about forty five thousand contracts, and that then at thirty twenty they're short uh, thirty thousand contracts. So that's the actual spread. So the dealer position in theory is the opposite of that, right? Dealers are short puts at thirty five eighty. So if we kind of break down in that level, volatility should expand and pick up, right? Because dealers are short that put, uh, that makes them need to possibly short futures, and that, you know that, that all just sort of feeds down in this interesting level of the 3,400, you know, pre-pandemic high. Um, but it's, it's you know, it's very interesting to, to, to hear your thoughts on that as well. So um, there, there are a lot of synergies, I think, in and around a lot of these things. I mean, I've had people who, who look at Fibonacci levels and, and who look at uh, all sorts of different, you know, interesting metrics and technical analysis say, man, it's, it's so interesting how this lines up with this option level or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's a lot of fascinating ways that, that these different uh, – methods of looking at the market all all overlap right and and we talk about it all the time which is you know a confluence of events a confluence of levels like uh you know 30 uh, i think what are we what are we looking at 3875 roughly mm -hmm. on on the uh, e-mini which is uh two different fibonacci levels from two different time periods right from the oh, weekly and the daily and so, and we saw that in crude as well. And I don't know how much you do with the energy complex, but um, crude has uh, two different levels that are coming in within 50 cents of each other based on uh, two different two different time ranges, not time periods, but kind of a shorter retracement and a longer retracement. So for sure. And then, you know, to overlay something from a completely different market, right? Fibonacci is just price analysis. Yeah. And then, you know, to see how it would line up based on, the the options market certainly i think you know the the more varied data that you can incorporate into your tool set the better we we talk about not having redundant technical analysis if you have three or four different momentum indicators that's confusing but if you have one momentum indicator one volatility indicator now you have an options uh, what's happening in the options market indicator, uh, you know, that that just when they all line up, it just seems pretty powerful. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, a lot of it is about sort of, uh, you know, t time and price, I guess, right? And, uh, and, and cycles. I mean, I think that's what a lot of uh, the technical analysis as well is kind of based on different, different cycles. And, and uh, that's certainly what the options market is based on, right? It's a, it's a, it's generally a 30-day cycle that's tied to the monthly options expiration, and and inside of that, there's some other, you know, smaller catalysts, right? But but there is this pretty consistent 30-day cycle. Uh, and if you pull up a chart and 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 look at uh, interim lows, right, in the market or interim highs, a lot of them are tied to that third Friday of the month, 
Um, and you can you can see some interesting you know movements in and around there, uh, which oftentimes you know look I think a lot of times people are looking for you know what news just moved the market and I can't find a reason to ascribe to this but you know you look and there'll be a big options trade right that took place and if you know like look that the technical trend is in track for me to want to buy the market if it's going up why did it just sell off so hard oh it was just because an options trade got hedged out now the trend can resume right so there's that extra little piece of information that okay, your technical study was intact until some bizarre little thing happened. Well, that bizarre thing was kind of an exogenous event of a trade happening. Didn't break sort of a, necessarily break a thesis that you had a technical thesis. Um, you know, it was, it was more a function of, uh, of, again, of an exogenous, you know, very short-term event. Right. And that's that could be, you know, have nothing to do with the, what the technical say, right? It could be circumstantial to whoever had that position, right? Um, yep. A couple of questions, Brent. Miguel Ortiz writes, and we touched upon this, what's better for the market CPI above or below the 8.6 mark is, is the reference. And I, what, I, what I was hearing from what you were saying is it's, uh, you know, a jump. Uh, if we miss the mark, if we come in higher than 8.6, and I'm going to say miss is, is CPI is higher than than what's expected, uh, we'll see a, a knee-jerk reaction to the downside. But then that also might say, well, if that, that just indicates that the Fed has to continue with their plan, right, to raise the rates mm. 70 basis points, maybe be even more aggressive, which would then do the reverse effect, right? If the if we see some raising of rates, we should see the market be buoyed again. What, and, and what are your thoughts in terms of, um, that kind of thing if we miss if we if we hit what's better for the market i not, i think a number sort of at or below is better for the market mainly because this is all about expectations right and i think the fundamental problem with the market right now is that no one no one knows what the future path of interest rates are going to be we're getting a better idea now of of sort of how many hikes are necessary and there and there's a lot shifting from a macro perspective uh you know, when you look at various interest rate barometers that suggest that the hikes are going to sort of slow down towards the end of next year, 2023. But in general, if you don't know, you know, if we're going to get 75 basis points on, you know, the next FOMC and then 50 the next or 100 the next or whatever it may be, if you don't have any understanding of that at all, you can't price anything, right? You can't price bonds. You can't price equities. You can't, uh, you know, currencies are affected. Come on, everything's affected, right? And so if that, inflation number comes in at or under you know what the market is uh looking for then that suggests that the fed can you know maybe pause and that so so then people are going to have a better understanding of how interest rates are going to change going forward and i think that's equity market positive because now you can start to price fundamentally future cash flows or whatever else you you it is you, you need to price if we get a hotter number obviously you know that's bearish it's going to keep a lot of pressure on the market in through the fomc i think it also just elevates uncertainty right because how is the Fed going to react to this? Everyone's concerned that they're raising into a recession. A recession is going to pick up. So that just makes the whole thing just much more confusing, right? And, and you know, I'd leave it to, I don't want to be a, a macro tourist here, but the, the expectations are everything. If you can't price something in, you know, then there, that's uncertainty, right? And uncertainty leads to volatility. If you know, if you have an understanding of how interest rates are going to move or a better understanding, or you can tighten down your forecast, then you can start to price things. And I think asset volatility writ large will come down because of that. Uh, and that's equity market positive. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. That that was good. And I like the term you said, macro tourist, right? <laughs> did, I think you, did you coin that? No, no, it's actually a, a friend of mine, you know, is, uh, Kevin Muir, he, he runs a podcast called Market Huddle. His, his site's actually called Macro Taurus. And it's so funny because everyone just gets dragged into disgusting macro these days, you know, and I think the, the real macro aficionados, uh, you know, get a little agitated by that. But but that's it's so dominant right in the market that you need to have a base understanding of what's happening. And, and so I try to give a very simple view and hopefully don't stray off path too much in a spot that'll get me in trouble. But um, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And, and you know, Jim and I talk about uncertainty, uncertainty and I, I had looked at it kind of a little bit differently, but I think you're right. I think, you know, it's not uncertainty in what the Fed's going to do necessarily in the next meeting. It's really kind of the whole path, which allows you to price further than the next week, the next month, but really into next year. And that's where the options market really comes into play, right? Because that's where you're, that's where you're seeing a lot of uh, activity 
you know, out past December into next year. And that's where, you know, having that certainty of what they're going to do and how the rates are going to rise again, helps you with pricing. So, you know, that's, that's a great, great point about that. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks to Miguel, Miguel for the question. And I think there's some irony there too. You know, I, I don't know if there's going to be a recession or not. Uh, everyone's got their, you know, two cents to throw in, but it is an interesting from a longer term market perspective is, it, you know, if we're heading into a recession, then maybe we just get a relief rally off of all this, but then the recession hits and then indicators start to turn. So, uh, you know, that's a complicated, uh, you know, analysis. Again, the options market that we focus on tends to happen, you know, again, the 30 day cycle. Um, but when you look at the volatility premium a little bit farther out in time, you know, it has been somewhat quiet, I would say. And, and again, a lot of this is because of the fact that you know, we talk about SKUs been flat in the options market. Again, it's the lack of demand, excuse me, for tail protection. And when we say tail protection, it's owning out of the money puts, right, in case the market goes limit down or something like that. Um, and because the market's had this controlled demolition, slow sell-off, you know, there, there really hasn't been the big VIX spike this year, right? And uh, and there hasn't been this this major reaction. And, and you get one of these aberrant data points in here, um, you know, if it comes in, if the inflation level comes in hotter, I think that really complicates the whole situation for everybody. Um, and that could really, you know, raise uh, volatility quite a bit, right? And and so, um, you know, that, that could create a much murkier short-term uh, situation, you know, th than if we just get sort of an, an at expectation or under expectation reading, um, just I think creates a little bit of clear sailing for the, for the next couple of weeks. Right, great. Uh, another question, Andrew Morris asks, and Andrew's a regular on our on our uh, daily shows. Are are there volume spikes, daily or weekly volume spikes that correspond with these option walls? So we talked about the call wall being at four thousand. Uh, are there uh, volume spikes? And I'm going to assume that he means in the futures market. But um, you know, if you could answer that to the best of your ability, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we do in our with our daily levels that we put out is we label them in terms of size. So not every options level matters, right? We we have a size that we calculate based on statistical data that says, okay, if the if the size of hedging flows tied to this level isn't of X size, then we don't include it as one of our levels. So what sort of a level is past that barometer of minimum size, we then rank them. And what you find is that the levels that have the highest ranking tend to show up as areas that on a volume profile chart have a lot of distribution, I guess I would use the term, or a lot more activity at those levels. So, you know, we'll have a chart plotted where you'll have our lines plotted. Uh, if you're using NinjaTrader now uh, in your Spot Gamma subscriber, you can pull our levels in each day. They update automatically onto your NinjaTrader charts, and you can overlay those with the volume profile. And you can see that there will be volume distributions pick up or, or volume exchanges increase at these key levels. Um, so the answer to that question is yes. I've seen that, and I would say it's you know more anecdotal from watching this information. I've not actually been able to take intraday day futures volume um, and lay them over. Not to also just sort of uh, over promote my platform, but there's a free seven day trial. So you want to try it out, overlay the all this data on your on your charts yourself and look at it. Love for you to do that, and the proof will be in the pudding. If it's there, great, and you continue with it. If not, then no harm, no foul, right? But the other thing we've done is that we've looked at this on an individual stock basis as well. So one of the things we do is we op monitor the options flow that comes in the market in real time. We have this indicator card, indicator called the hero indicator. And what you can see is that oftentimes when we hit a key level, like 3,900 is our key level of the upside, you'll see the options flow come in uh, that will often be, in this case, it'll be selling options, selling calls and buying puts. So we call negative delta flow will kick in as the market hits, in this case, 3,900. And that's an indication of pressure coming down. We've also seen... Uh, in data with our, we partner with the, with the NASDAQ on some things and they have this data tool that allows you to zoom into the microsecond on individual equities. And we've seen in individual equities that when big options prints go on, uh, there's a volume spike right down to the millisecond. We can see volume spike when these options trades hits. So we've been able to sort of tie this out from the macro kind of, you know, volume profile level uh, all the way down to kind of the millisecond, um, you know, distribution patterns in, in individual equities. Oh, that's great. I love it. Um, you know, one thing where we, we, you mentioned individual stocks and you mentioned the E-mini S&P. 
Do you look at any other markets on the on the future side? Do you look at uh, Nasdaq? Do you you know where can you apply this um, beyond the E mini S and P? Yeah. So the the big three are are obviously the S and P. The Nasdaq is a is a very large market. And what's interesting about the Nasdaq is that a lot of our data is sourced from the QQQ ETF because there's a lot more uh, option open interest that trades. There's a lot more options volume relative to the NDX. The NDX is growing substantially. They're also uh, launching the futures product, the VolQ product. So there are there's a there's a lot of growth in the Nasdaq, uh, the NDX complex. But the the Qs is actually a big driver. And I think that is kind of an interesting uh, lens to look at it through because a lot of people trade the NASDAQ futures, probably maybe they look at the NDX, but they don't maybe don't monitor the Qs as much and understand that that that, that Qs can op- option, the Qs can oftentimes wag the NASDAQ index dog, so to speak. Um, and then the other one is the Russell, the Russell options complex. Again, IWM has more options volume and is, is quite impactful there. So, so we tie the IWM and the Russell together in the way that we look at that market. Um, so those are the kind of the big three. Uh, we do look at the volatility complex of so the VIX futures a lot, not necessarily from a trading level, but just from a general flow standpoint, um, you know, sort of buying and selling pressure, I guess, in that, in that volatility complex. Uh, we've not yet got into the energy uh, commodities. And, and the main reason is that uh, I have an equities background and a lot of what takes place in the commodities market is things that we just don't clearly understand. You know, there's there's crack spreads and there's, you know, <laughs> there's uh, companies that are hedging for purposes that have nothing to do with speculation. And, and there's all sorts of other, you know, nuances to those markets. Right. Uh, that I think are really important to understand. And so, yeah, we can highlight, you know, where big open interest is, but it's much harder for us to sort of assess the nuances of all the flows there. Um, and so that's one thing that's kind of prevented us from really diving hard into the into the commodities markets. Great, uh, Brent. Just just quickly, do you do you have um, just like you have a call wall for the E mini S and P? Uh, you, you have uh, thirty seven downside on, as that um, put wall. Do you do you have anything? Can you show us with the Nasdaq, or is it uh, we're not ready for that on this chart? Um, I have the so I have the Nasdaq up here. Let me see. Let me see if I get the Nasdaq symbol in here. I did have a uh, a little bit of a data issue there before, so I'm not sure if I'm perm from my Nasdaq. Let me check. Gotcha. It's uh, apologize for putting you uh, a little yeah, no, bit on the spot right. here. It's totally we all right. Just... It's a very simple. It's a very simple request. Kenny loads the Nasdaq up, uh, and I should say, yeah, no problem. Yep. So here's the. Uh, so I have the NASDAQ up on my screen here, and I'll just pull up the key levels there for the NASDAQ. So we have a couple of major levels here. The big one, uh, so we call it large gamma one, is this 1300 level up here. Oops, sorry, let me zoom back out. Uh, is the 1300 level up here. So you can see that was a prior high. There's probably a bunch of technical analysis that shows up there, but we have a large gamma there, which means there's a bunch of open interest. The second one is 12,500, which is here again. You know, you look at some of the, the technical analysis pieces, that's probably a level that's familiar with you. And then the most interesting level uh, from our perspective in the NASDAQ is right here at 1275. And we call that our vol trigger. And what that essentially means is that under that level is where dealers should be shorting the NASDAQ as the market goes down. Um, and so if we kind of are under that level, the general options flows are going to be ones that expand volatility and kind of keep pressure on the uh, on the NASDAQ. If we break over that 1275 level, that's where we think it, that's a bullish signal for us, right? That's kind of a, you know, you want to get on board with the rally. Very similar to the S&P here at 3900. That's kind of our bull bear line where the dynamic in the options, dynamics in the options market say that, look, the bullish flows will, there's bullish support here, right? There's an options tailwind over 3,900, over 12,100 in the NASDAQ. Um, and under those two levels, 12,075 and 3,900, you know, the bears kind of have the have the edge. That's great. Uh, Brent, you know, we're running up on time. The time always goes fast. I think it was just a lot of information here. I hope People can come back and watch it again because I will, and I'll I'll find out more. I'm sure. But just so everybody knows, how can they get a hold of you if they want to follow up? You mentioned uh, uh, being able to access Spot Gamma these levels on Ninja Trader. How can they do that? Sure. So if you go to SpotGamma.com, there's a subscribe now button. You get a free seven day trial, and we include a 
uh, feature in there that allows you to import our levels each day it happens automatically into into ninja trader so you can import those levels for uh, the nasdaq iwm excuse me nasdaq russell uh, spx as well as the spiders cues in, in iwm so all that happens automatically each day those levels are pushed out to you around three in the morning i'm also at spot gamma on twitter uh, we do a lot there and then we also have a youtube channel which is youtube slash spot gamma uh, where there's a lot of instructional videos and just, you know, we, we get into the weeds on some of the dynamics that we discussed here today, sort of the impact on volatility and, and why some of these different uh, metrics matter. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. That's been, again, a treat. I'm glad you could come back and talk about what's happening today. Um, want to thank everybody for participating and uh, just want to wish everybody a, a happy rest of the trading day. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate it.